Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the English Language Teaching Center's lecture series entitled It's All Right. I'm Amarjit from ELTC, and I will be the moderator for today's session. We are excited to have you join us online this morning. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to the presenter by typing your questions in the YouTube chat se section. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Please take note that there will be an attendance link that will be shared in the chat box. There will be two sections to today's presentation. We would take a short five-minute break in between the sections. With that said, let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen J. Hall as our guest speaker today. He is a very familiar face among us from the education fraternity. For those who are meeting him for the first time, let me give you a brief introduction. Professor Stephen is the Dean School of Interdisciplinary Studies and Head Center of English Language Studies, Sunway University, Malaysia, where he has worked for over 14 years. He has managed national education projects, been a corporate trainer, and trained Asian teachers. Stephen has worked in Southeast Asia since 1991 and has taught primary, secondary, and tertiary learners and educators. Dr. Hall has over 50 publications, including seven books, and recently, with Dr. Lee Sukim, Kim, co-authored Manglish, Malaysian English at its vacuest, something that I'm looking forward to read soon. Good morning, Prof, and welcome. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this exciting series. Oh, we are very so much delighted to have you on board, Prof. Thank you. Actually, further, yeah. actually, it's actually coming up in about two weeks to 20 years in Malaysia. So there we go. Wow. Excellent. <laughs> Without further ado, I would now turn the session over to Prof to begin. Thank you very much, Marjit. And thank you very much, Altec, for having me here. And thank you all for being here in this morning where we've got the title it's all right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just take a minute or two to, uh, to get some slides to share with you. And uh, what I want to do is to take you on the journey of writing, yeah? the important journey of writing. And what we want to look at is in two parts. The first part is to look at what is going on in terms of being a creative writer. Yeah, so I want to look at the being a creative writer and the fact that often we encounter the writer's block. Now, I hope you can all see my slides there. Um, are you able to see tackling the writer's block, reflection and interaction? Are we good with that? Okay, so what I want to do is take you on a journey and by reflection and interaction, I want us to maybe consider who we are as writers. At the same time, what I want to do is to talk about some lessons that apply to both creative writing and also to academic writing. I'd like to reflect on the why of writing and the idea of building a through line in whatever we do. And in doing that, 
I'm going to draw on some things from TED Talks. And you may say, why? But actually, some of the macro organization of a TED Talk applies to what we do when we write, whether it's creative fiction or it's academic. Now, as a writer, one of the problems I find sometimes is keeping the motivation going, just like our students do. And then I'd like to deal with the fact that often we have to handle what editors do when we write. And this can be a difficult process because quite often when we write, we think, wow, I'm brilliant. I'm fantastic. What's this editor doing messing up my writing? So I'd like to share some insights that I think I've gained often painfully about the editing process and then talk about the important reaching the audience. So this session, in other words, is going to be focused more on creative writing. And reflecting on the why we write, I think the key is that we all have stories to share. Everybody has stories inside us. But perhaps these stories are really only told if we're able to use good descriptive language to weave images together. And this really means that we have to draw on our own vocabulary. And this is where reading and writing link so much, because I find reading other people's writing helps me enormously when it comes to composing my own thoughts. And especially if I'm moving to an Another important reason we write, we have something to say, we have a position to advocate. We want people to hear our opinion. Hey, so nice to see some familiar names coming up there in the chat. Yeah, good morning, Jayshree, great to see you here. So, reflecting on the why, one of the main things is writing is something you do alone. It's a profession for introverts who want to tell you a story, but don't want to make eye contact while doing it. John Green is quite a prolific fiction writer. And this is always one of the weirdest things when you write. You don't want to be disturbed. You don't want to know people. And if you have a major writing project, you may get asked a question which I had when I was writing one of my books where someone rang up to ask whether I had died or not because they hadn't heard from me. Because sometimes when you're writing, you do get so into it and you know you need to be disciplined. We'll hear more about that. So writing is sharing a story, and really the key is to get something that your audience can empathize with. And this may depend a lot on including details, including descriptive passages that mean that the reader can picture what you want to say. So this is where Vygotsky talks about the inner voice what's going on inside the head at the time that the person is reading. And we will never know about the image processing, but descriptive choices are really important to get the audience involved. And I suppose the other thing, especially in writing fiction, whether it's even a poem, or a short story, or even a haiku. You want to build some tension. So let me take this general idea and apply it to different genre. Whether it's a haiku in that the first, uh, the first few syllables, or it's a paragraph, or a chapter, or an overall no novel, Within each of those frameworks, so just bear with me while you picture different length frameworks, we need to build tension or curiosity or inner questions. 
So say, for example, if you're writing a chapter in a book, at the end, you want to leave them hanging out for more, right? You want a bit of tension so they do read the next chapter. And this requires a lot of plotting and planning. And as we will hear later from someone who writes a lot of books and does very well at it, John Gresham, this often requires that you've mapped it out first. A bit like research, academic research. You have to know what you think the answer is going to be before you do the rest in some ways. And so tempering this building up of tension and adding to it is the right dose of details. So say, for example, one of my favorite writers, who also happens to be my wife, she likes to throw in little bits of details about the nonyas to evoke images. Yeah, and so this may even mean using Baba Malay to or, or Hokkien to add the detail to build the empathy with the reader. And yet, in her short stories, they end with the resolution. Although you can always leave the reader thinking a bit, not totally, this is the end of the story. And definitely none of our students approach of, I woke up and it was a dream. I hate that. So you will write if you want to share a story. And in sharing that story, there's an old formula from Sir Keith Robinson, a wonderful educator. And so what I like to do sometimes is to take from different genre and look at set principles that are useful. And here he is describing TED Talks. He's describing TED Talks, right? The short 17 minute talks. There's an old formula for writing essays that says a good essay answers the three questions. What? So what? Now what? So it's a bit like that if you're writing. And so it's for more than TED Talks. It's an old essay formula. So we're looking at sharing your song something that you want to write about that is speaking from yourself. Because if you don't write from a passionate stance, people can see it. If you haven't done the research for the character to know that the details are place wise, time wise, accurate, people will see through it all. So a key to a lot of good writing is really knowing the content, but being passionate about it and being able to get inside the feelings. So this is where a, a good vocabulary is so important. And this is why I keep saying to my students who are writing, you must read, you must read, you must read. You must go beyond the working everyday native speakers, 5,000 essential words so that you can add the color with a good level of vocabulary. Whoops, I went a bit fast there. So as I'm writing, and this is both academic and fiction, I really ask myself, am I passionate about this topic? You know, and this is the same for people who are embarking on the permanent head damage journey, the PhD, the piled head deep. Yeah. You've really got to be passionate about the topic for the journey. And it's the same if you're writing a poem, you have to feel it. And this is why it's so difficult when I sit on a panel for a, a nationwide essay writing competition, which Sunway runs with Oxford Society, Oxford and Cambridge Society. And picking the topics is really difficult because we have to find something that people can bend their head around and get their heart involved in to be passionate about it. And as they're writing, and as everyone's writing, we always have to think about what is the hook at the beginning? 
and I know you teach this in in writing. And reading for the hook is also very interesting as a skill. How do you get the reader in? And is this a, a gap that you're filling in the writing? Is this something new? You know, I don't think there's going to be too many people writing more poems about daffodils or wandering down a road to know where a road unknown, for example. So we need to find something fresh that a reader goes, oh, wow, I hadn't really thought about this one. And in order to have that sense of freshness, we need to consider, am I creating a picture in my reader's head? Have I given them enough detail that they can internally visualize? Now, the next one is really tricky. Am I credible as a writer? Well, the credibility comes behind with a clear through line. You're taking the reader on a mental journey. It may be a new place. It may be a new time. It may be a new paradigm. Your credibility is how easy they find the journey. So the key to writing of all kinds really is how much are you signposting where you're going to go, where the reader is going to go without giving away too much? Yeah, because you give away too much, they will just go to the last chapter. So credibility is to do with the through line and the creation of the images. Now, when we're writing a longer piece of writing, and even in textbooks, you have to do this, we sometimes need to look at recurring key words and recurring images that help the through line, help the continuity. You know, symbols sometimes that come up every now and again so that people go, oh, yes, I remember back to that. So this kind of mapping of where you're going in writing is very important. And then once you're getting your story together or you're thinking about it, are you so clear about it? Are you clear about it to the extent that you're able to do a elevator pitch about your story, you know, the 12 to 20 words? Because actually, if you can't do that, you know, the key kind of summative view of it, you may not have properly thought through where you want to go. So that sort of summarizing thing, I think, is important to internalize in your own head. So later, we will hear from a very experienced writer about how he systematizes is thinking for a long text, namely the novel, the what in Malaysia we call the storybook. So, why do I put here a metaphor? Yeah, some stories are actually giant metaphors, and it strikes me that often uh, metaphors and similes get forgotten and they're extremely important. And of course, this is the mark sometimes of a skilled writer, the use of metaphors, similes, and idioms. And of course, for second language learners, these are often really, really difficult areas. But they are areas that add great richness to writing. I'd now like to move on to a little bit about the how of writing. And um, I, I guess uh, we've had some of this already kind of prescribed for us with the last two years of COVID, where we, you know, we didn't have a lot of choice where we were working. But I think when we're writing, it's important to have a dedicated space. 
And certainly I know when I was doing my doctorate, I basically had do not touch study table area. Um, it just means that you've got a mindset that this is where I'm going to write. So I'm on some other things of the how. I think it's important that we time the writing chunks that we work with. Because this impacts on motivation overall. Um, I find if I write more than uh, two and a half to three hours, if I do more than two hours in a stretch, that after the two hours, I'm ending up writing absolute rubbish, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is real garbage. What am I doing this for? So it's important to just set a target and work with in it. And I'll share one technique shortly. Now, the other one is, you know, the old story, it's 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration, really. However, having said that, a technique I find is that I do have a piece of paper and a pen by my bed because occasionally I'll wake up in the morning or even with a lovely dream with an idea. And if I don't scribble it down, I lose it. So while most of the writing is being disciplined and going for the perspiration, leave space for the inspiration. And when it strikes you, scribble it down, because sometimes at two hours later, you think, oh, that was a brilliant idea. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, what was it? And, you know, we write and we look back at it and we think, eh, did I write that rubbish? But it's important to be positive and maybe focus on the really good sentence or two that you have there. And then you come back later and you might fix it and change it. And this, I guess, is one of the biggest things about writing. It's writing, rewriting, sharing with a critical friend, someone who's interested in your work, whose opinion you value, show them the stuff and they'll come back and say, I don't know what you mean by this. And you think, oh, it's absolutely clear. Brilliance. And this is one of the biggest things for novice writers. And also our students. And for trainee teachers to accept criticism. So, you know, celebrate the good sentence or two, but be open to a critical friend assisting with writing. Now, if you get stuck, sometimes you could use writing prompts to get yourself going if you want to write, but you feel stuck. So I'd commend a website here for you, which is writersdigest.com. OK, so this is where, as I would say to my students, which we didn't say about 10 years ago, take a picture. So writersdigest.com has got a lot of very practical advice to stimulate writing, including some prompts. Because sometimes when we're writing, we, we get stuck. You know, we, we sort of eh, don't feel really into it. So sometimes it's good to just step back look at some of these helpful websites or read something that inspires you because although we want to be original often we are reworking other people's brilliant ideas so reading other writers is really important to shaping motivation let me move on now to talk about the whole timing thing now I'm a great last minute guy, actually, to be very frank with you. And that's because uh, if I set a goal, I often don't really get cranked up until the goal is quite close. But you want to meet the goals that you set. And in writing, that may just be, I'm just going to write for uh, an hour. I'm just going to write for an hour. Um, because of the way our wonderful human mind works, it's no good saying I'm going to write a thousand words. 
uh, because it might not happen. And sometimes 2,000 might happen. Um, it depends a lot on what's happening in your head. And that's very hard to predict at times. So one thing is to set a goal and say, okay, I'm just going to go for a set time for writing. And then, you know, of course, we always have deadlines. And if you elongate the deadlines, you know, that's a slippery slope. I have the Pomodoro technique I'll talk about shortly. But don't always wait for inspiration. Sometimes it's just, okay, I know what I want to do here. I'm just going to go for it and write. And sometimes it'll be brilliant. And other times you think, eh, no, not really. But plan and learn from the experts. So let's look at one of these experts. A man who's written a lot and is very well known, and I'm sure you've all heard of him before. So have a look at the picture. Yes, he's a Matsali. And my video is not going to play, I see. Okay. So let me let me summarize then what John Grecian says he does. And it's very interesting. When John Grecian writes, what he always does is he writes in the same place. He rather boringly has the same cup of coffee. Yes. And he turns off all social media and says to the universe, this is my writing time. And away he goes and writes. So he says he will write for two hours every morning at the same time. Now, as teachers and teacher educators, we may not have that luxury. But I find in my job as, as a, a, a dean and head of Center for English Language Studies at Sunway University, I have to do the same if I want to write. I have to put in my timetable writing period. And ignore the world because creativity requires mental space and something that has been talked about by some people who study semiotics or symbols as the idea of flow and you know if you don't start you don't get the flow and if you say i can't start because i don't feel inspired you'll never get the flow and the flow really comes by doing. So this idea of flow, and Grisham talks about this as well. He said, I, my idea of flow is I know I'm going to write at this time. So basically, I have to let the flow happen. And that requires having a goal for the writing session. So what I, I've found in looking at the way other people write, because they're probably doing more than I am and, you know, getting famous and all that kind of stuff. But what I found when they talk about their writing, they talk about having a goal, a time goal, because sometimes the words flow easier than others. And you can frustrate yourself if you say, I'm going to do a thousand words by now. Now, at the same time as people like Grecian set themselves up and say, this is my writing time, we have to leave room for the aha moments that may happen. And sometimes this may happen on exotic times when you're sitting on the throne, New Zealand slang for going to the toilet, when you're relaxed. Or sometimes it may happen when you're walking in the park and you just go, oh, yeah, if you've been thinking about the writing, you've got to capture those. Even if you turn on the phone and record the thought. I say that because I personally have lost a lot of ideas by being too lazy and not seizing the moment, not doing the, you know, the dead poet society of seize the day. So it's a balance between the discipline uninterrupted chunks of time and staying open to the 
inspiration side of things as well. So, I'd like to share something about my creative side now. So it's good to have a little bit of the personal voice. And what I want to share is a poem that I wrote. How did this come about? A friend of mine contacted me. This is a, an old friend called Alan Maley. And he said, I want to put together a collection of poems to do with COVID so that we have a uh, we have, uh, you know, COVID poems. Yes, Audrey, I agree with you. John Grecian is a, an amazing writer and he keeps you hanging on. So he practices some of the things we talked about before, like in the litigators. He's well researched. So I'm just picking up on the chat here, folks. So I'm deviating a little to answer something in the chat from Audrey Lim. The, the thing about John Grecian is he's able to... Um, to at the end of each chapter leave you hanging for the more but what he does in planning his writing he's already plotted out the whole novel that he starts in a in a january to finish in a july he's already worked out the plots and the subplots so he spends a lot of time and before he starts writing researching the particular area whether it's litigation or or, or smuggling or uh, organized crime he spends time researching the topic and he plots out the storylines so this is what good novelists do you actually have worked out the back and forwards and the loop backs so this is a bit like script writing for for hollywood and it's the same even with, with Ken, Ken, uh, Ken Foley, who really does use detail a lot as well. So what they do, um, what if you go on to ask Uncle Google, and you'll see there's quite a lot of John Grisham talking on Uncle Google. What they do is they make sure that they've worked out the storyline, the through line for the whole novel, and also the through lines for the subplots. So it's kind of like, if you like, a whole series of lines running all together and crisscrossing back and forth and looping back. So this is this is a, the kind of thinking side that goes in before you start telling the story. This doesn't really work to just sit down and I've got an idea and then let the idea take you without knowing what the journey is going to be. So um, just because I noticed many of you are saying that you like John Grecian, what the point that he makes is he says, before he sits down to actually write the detailed prose, he's already worked out what the ending is going to be. Um, and as for building his cliffhangers, if you look at the cliffhangers, you will see that they all, well, not all, but many of them involve incomplete action or a lack of disclosure of where one of the characters are going so there is always a gap to be filled and so in terms of concepts the end of the chapter is a gap in your knowledge to be filled it's kind of in a way similar to academic writing where you aim to fill a gap yeah but what's happening here is the reader is left going I want more. And if you look at the, if you analyze the cliffhangers, and, and I mean, uh, um, both Grisham and most thriller writers do this, right? They've actually worked out because you, you watch where the cliffhanger gets resolved and you look at the patterning for the cliffhanger being resolved. And this, of course, is what happens when people write sequels as well. Okay. For those of you having trouble registering, uh, in the five-minute break, uh, Amarjit can maybe help you out with that one. So here we go. I, um, my creative writing is, at the moment, is not so much in prose because my prose that I'm writing is often academic writing. 
Um, I haven't done textbooks for a while, a bit busy, but it's academic writing. But my creative writing is in, in poems. So the impetus for this poem was the fact that, let's face it, we had a lot of time in our houses with COVID. And um, as I said earlier, my friend asked for contributions to a book of poems. So I'd like to share one with you and say that I'm really into um, alliteration in a big way. And I think alliteration is a very useful thing. And secondly, I hope, as, as you mentioned in the chat here, that I'm evoking some emotion in what I'm sharing here. And I'm also hopefully looking at some empathy. And then I hope that what I'm doing here is also evoking some images. Yeah. So this is cyclonic thoughts during COVID Corral Day 66. My title already, I'm into alliteration, right? It's day 66, and the devil did not do it. Movement control order, now conditional with a long list. Crushing in on me are memories of court. Crashing, no can, walls of water in wind. Comfort level, I can hardly read, no. And remembered casualties, not zoomed on screens of comfort couch wallowing. In 86, Solomon Islands, housebound, then driving, driving rain, slopes slid, slips and streets. Okay, I won't read the whole lot. But I hope you got the idea that what I'm trying to do is to also use the sounds. And so when we write, we need to evoke images and also use sounds because we are working with what in a voice is going to get going. OK, so this is a, a short poem that I wrote to do with coronavirus. Now, whenever you write, though, remember I said, you know, there's the loneliness of the long distance runner, but there's also the loneliness of the writer. And so you write something and you feel a bit alone and then you send it off to be published and the publisher comes back and says, hey, what is this rubbish? And, um, you know, this is one of the things that can happen with writing. So I'd like to now look at both the editing process and also the getting your writing out there if you are a potential writer. So you want to avoid the kind of feelings that we see in the slide. Because one of the writer's blocks that we look at is the self-doubt that we may have as a writer. So this is where I talk about the need for reflection. So if we are being a writer, you know, and if you say to pe many people, they ask, what do you do? You say, well, I'm a writer. They go, ah, oh, yeah, you know. But if you are being a writer, really, the real inspiration is going to come from yourself. And as I said earlier, we also need to learn from all around us in different ways so that we find aha moments and we capture them. And really important, whether you're writing fiction or you are co-writing or you're writing academically, which I'm going to talk about in the second half, but in all of those forms, all of those genre, find a critical listener, find a critical reader, and this is what happens even if you're writing a play. You need to workshop it. You need to get critical readers who go, I don't get how that worked. Hey, that was left hanging. Where did it go? So this critical friend, and we, we talk about this in, in writing literature, a critical friend, someone who's not being 
a, a bastion of criticism, but is rather analyzing and seeing what works for them. Because our inner voice that we may base our writing on comes from different experiences from our readers. So a critical friend to help you out is really, really important. Yeah. And I'll give you some hints about how to network and build on this one shortly. So the critical friend as a writer or a potential writer. It's useful to share the journey because the very nature of writing is inward. It's introverted. Do you remember back to the what I shared earlier on? You know, it is a lonely pursuit because you were there with the keyboard, banging away, wanting to not be disturbed. That's why you must have empathy too for people who are writing PhDs. I tell you, it's like becoming a monk. So sharing the journey. Reading circles. Um, go and ask Uncle and Auntie Google, you know, the people that everybody asks everything about, uh, about uh, a local uh, colleague, a local friend and her reading circle. That's uh, This is for KL-based people, a Klang Valley-based people. Um, Sharon Bakar, who's been in Malaysia longer than me, um, she has a reader's circle where people share their writing. And this is both fiction it's both poetry, it's all kinds of things. So you want to find out about what's happening, just have a look at Sharon Bucker's website and you'll find out about the Reader's Circle that now is back meeting once a month. Yeah, and it's much better than online, of course, to be face to face. So check that out because what she has is a group of people, young writers, established authors, and they share, they share their work through reading. And this is a good way of becoming inspired because you see other people writing and it's always you know exciting to hear the words come alive through the voice of the writer so there are literary sharing circles too book lovers club for example the the kl book appreciation club facebook where people share what they're reading as well you can't be a good writer unless you read unless you're open to what's happening around you. And that, of course, involves, as I said, accepting constructive criticism. So this gives us the space to talk through the writing journey and the blocks. So just to recap, some of the blocks are that people may not really know what we're doing and they may pretend to be interested, but they're not really. Um, then you may find some people who are genuinely interested. Find those people to support you in the writing journey. And then remember that sometimes having a goal, short goals, helps a lot. Yeah, it helps. So on this journey towards the distance white cliffs, there are going to be some rocky parts. So if you've set out to say, I'm going to, I'm going to write a, write three poems about this. Remember that going back, editing, leaving it to simmer, leave a day or two, go back to it is important because then you may see some rocks in the reader's understanding before you get to the white cliffs. This is from my hometown of Gisborne in New Zealand. And that's uh, young Nick, uh, a young boy who was on James Cook's ship that pointed to these white cliffs when the British discovered that New Zealand existed. Um, why do I mention this? Because I ended up going into a competition to do with this particular European explorer on the basis of my first published poem, which was about exploration. And I think exploration is critical to writing. Now, as we write, though, inevitably we encounter the fact that we submit our work and we suddenly a publisher says yay i like your your poem your short story or your book or your academic paper brilliant however inevitably another pair of eyes will find errors 
or things that they go, I don't quite get that. So this is the role of editing and how we handle the editorial feedback is really important because we have to remember that the publisher is going to have their name on the work. And so this means that they are responsible for what goes into print. You know, they've got the ISBN number. Um, the other one who wants to try and make some money or get the book out there or the collection out there. So they are going to take responsibility for editing. Now, editing comes in, in three major forms. So just to outline, it could be developmental edits. And this is quite good when you're plotting a novel, for example. This is where you look at plot holes and long scenes and characters where the character arc doesn't really work. And by a character arc, you know that characters change and they, they are part of the plotting of a novel. How does the character evolve? How does she or he react to different things? Developmental editors, and there are such people, will actually look at that and they don't bother about the full stops and the semicolons. They look at the overall macro structure of a piece of writing. Have a look at a site called ReadZ, R-E-E-D-S-Y. Again, ask Uncle Google or Auntie Opera. Line edits are to do with the flow. And they look at things like, what is the narrative voice? Is there continuity in the narrator's voice? Is there um, change that spirals back to the earlier part of the book? Or is it just purely linear? You know, what is the... What is going on here? And the most common one, which is teachers and teacher educators we specialized in, is the bleeding all over the page, the days of red ink, proofreading. So what amazes me is how many people don't bother to use the built-in features of word grammar, or they don't look at the Google Doc uh, proofreading structures, which are there to help us out. You don't need to invest in Grammarly or one of, one of those such sites. And in fact, if you're writing fiction, you may want to avoid Grammarly because they don't like so-called flowery, bombastic or overly descriptive text. So be aware that proofreading, sometimes if you're using business English proofreading, may not be the best for the creativity and the details of fiction. And capture the inspiration with the notebook by the bed. So last part before we have a break, it's coming up shortly. We can have a stretch and grab a cup of coffee for the second part. The last part is, wow, you've done the writing. Yippee, it's finished. Well, it's finished until the editor comes back and then you fix it and then you, you fix it again and the editor comes back. But once you've got the beast, how do you reach the audience? First of all, let's backtrack a little. You should pilot with a critical friend. Get someone you like, whose opinion you value, show them the stuff, and tell them what do they say. For example, my wife sometimes says to me, oh, too cryptic, you're trying to do too much in one sentence. Okay, how could I fix it? And I listen, and I take suggestions. I mentioned writer's circles and reader's circles. Check them out. It can be lonely being a writer, but there are many of us out there. But sometimes we need to get together and say, hi, you also write. Reader and listener circles are very good for that. So share and network. Go online. Look at some of the Facebook groups. I know you might think Facebook is aunties and uncles territory, as my students say. But TikTok won't help you much with writing. So network and have a look. There are some really helpful, useful Facebook groups, just like there are for teacher development. One I'm plug here, Teachers Development Professional Voices Network. Now, if you want to aim for the big time and turn into the author of Harry Potter, who, remember, got numerous rejections. She got a lot of rejections. You could use an agent, but of course, you're paying money, so you have to be pretty certain that if you want to become a famous author, that you've got something good. 
And then you have to handle the rejections and persist and persist and try again and persist. Yeah. And if you've got an idea, one publisher may say this is total rubbish. Another publisher may like it. For example, when my very good friend Lee Su Kim published her uh, Pranakan trilogy, um, Sarong Secrets, Manic Mischief and Kabaya Tales, the publisher originally said, you can't have photographs in a collection of short stories. It hasn't been done in Asia. And Sukim said, we can do it. And it was done. And it sells very well because it's different. It's filling a gap. So you have to persist with your vision. So this is a long journey. It goes back and forth. But remember, if you have a passion to share a story, and you're exploring something that, that you think you can find an audience that will empathize with right on. Go for it and capture your story and your passion for others to share. So what I've tried to do today is to say, when you tackle the writer's block, reflect on the fact that you are not alone in this journey. There is a community of practice out there. And if you're a passionate reader, you know, and sometimes we may feel in Malaysia that literature has got lost because we don't have many literature students, but it's huge in the world. Reading is huge. And I don't just mean ebooks. Print is still in action. But either way, when you tackle the writer's block, reflect on the fact that you are part of a wider community. Make the space in your life, if you're doing a large piece of writing, where you say, this is my writing time, goodbye WhatsApp, I'm not going to answer any of those emails from work, put it down in the calendar, the work calendar, this is my writing time, and go for it. Stay open to inspiration. Remember to seize the moment, because sometimes you get an idea and go, yeah. For example, with my poem of Solomon Islands, a friend of mine had touched base with me and sent me some old photographs. And that's what stimulated my particular poem. So sometimes we need to stay open to the many varied poems that there are. So thank you for listening to the first part of this morning. Yep, we're going to, I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to, um, Amajid, uh, because we're going to go now to a um, five minute break. And I think you, Amajid, you have a few questions there to do with the registration. So I finished this part and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you for listening. And I'll pick up on questions at the end of both of these sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for that interesting session. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we will take a five-minute break. But uh, before that, uh, let me just uh, remind you that the attendance link is in the chat box. Uh, it is actually a functional link. Um, if you are unable to register, you probably need to um, log into your MOE email, number one. Number two, uh, make sure that you are using uh, the Google uh, browser and uh, not any other uh, browser to log in to the attendance link, right? Uh, so with that said, uh, it is 10.24. We will come back at exactly uh, 10.29 for the second session. Thank you for listening and uh, see you again in five minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a quick break. So let's um, hop in straight into the second section. So, Prof, over to you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just um, uploading slides at the moment. All right. So the second section, we're going to be looking at the academic voice. So this is um, on a more formal um, topic. Yeah. So let me just, I'm waiting while it uploads the slide. Just give me a minute or two, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, while waiting, please do think of um, questions and thoughts that you would like to share or ask uh, Prof and we will um, come back to that in today's session at the end, yeah? Thank you.
Are you able to see my slides now? So we can see your slides now, Prof. Okay, you can. Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies for that, folks. Um, what I want to do here, so thank you for being so patient. So I'm going to start, and um, we're going to talk about building academic identity through effective use of voice. So sorry about the bit of a slow start, but I hope you're all on with me in looking at building academic identity through effective use of voice. Now by voice, I don't mean the spoken voice. I mean the voice of the writer. And this is an issue sometimes with academic writing uh, because we have the challenge of being objective and yet maintaining one's own voice. And many times we can be uncertain about making our own voice hurt. And what I want to do is to show you that the voice is both absolutely necessary and even very valuable. And the context that I'm doing this in is in academic writing. So I'm addressing novice academic writers or those of you who are doing papers. And you may feel that you have to be objective and impersonal and take the whole voice out of academic writing. So what I want to do in this session is to briefly show some ways in which you can incorporate your own voice. Now, I'm not talking here about reporting purely quantitative research. So I'm coming out of qualitative research. And one of the things in all of this, of course, is we are in the company of more experienced and more scholarly voices. And so we may feel, oh my gosh, what right do I have to have my voice? And yet we want to be authoritative and we should. So this is prompted by the fact that we need to look at what writers do with the voices and how do they do that in academic writing. And if you are writing academically, you're producing a paper or something, you may have found some of the problem, some of the following problematic. What am I allowed to say in terms of having my presence in the objective word, supposedly objective world, of academic writing? And how personal and impersonal should I be in my writing? Can I use I? And we will answer some of these questions. And how do I make it clear where information comes from and where ideas come from? In other words, factual objective statements and an opinion. And yes, if you don't have any opinion in academic research, you're not addressing a research gap. Yes, objectivity is important, but so is having your own critical voices. And actually, many voices, many voices can be heard in an academic paper. So this links up to developing critical reading skills as well for our learners. So a research paper has many voices. It has the voices of the authors. This is an obvious one. But we also need to clearly signal in a research paper that there are other researchers and writers. And there are the research participants, the respondents. And in qualitative research, that means those that are being researched. And I know I've got some of my colleagues in this seminar that are part of this process with me. And then we have the reader. huh? The voice of the reader? I go back to what I said in the earlier half where I talked about the inner voice. In other words, as you write, 
you need to think about what about your recipient of your writing? What about the person who's going to read your work? Are you making the journey clear for them? Obviously, the author's voice is important, and sometimes this can be explicit. But so do other writers and researchers, and so the, their voices are added in, but there are more. The research participants. Now you may add their voice directly in the form of extracts from transcripts or indirectly through reports on interview or survey data. And how you add their voice can also include your opinion. So if you say, respondent X hesitantly stated that versus Respondents X categorically asserted that. Respondents X stated blandly. You are actually incorporating your, view, your views and your judgment while you report what is happening with the research participants. Have a quick read of this. Moral of your story. Know the reader. So what the reader might say, even if only to themselves, is important. So it's not heard directly in the text, but it's essential for the author to take it into account. Now, the biggest question we have when we're academically writing, writing academically, what identity would you like your author voice to project? I'm not talking narrator's voice, narrator's voice here. I'm talking the author's voice. And quite clearly, you want expertise and authority. And perhaps you want a critical or analytical approach. And this is one of the things when I read some academic articles. If I don't see any criticality, any analysis, any addition to just citing other research, it's not really a meaningful piece of academic writing. Perhaps also you may, at certain pieces of uh, writing and certain times, project your ideology, your viewpoint. Now, I'd like to now focus on the fact that in we're, when we're writing academically, we need to be establishing some critical viewpoint because we are addressing a research gap. If we are not creating something new, then perhaps the research is not so meaningful. And this involves sometimes taking our stance as a writer. And that's what I'd like to address next in terms of the term critical. So here I'm going to focus very much on qualitative research writing and the idea of being critical. And it's not this. I never show my sister anything I do. She's so critical. It's different when it's my tutor has told me that my writing is not critical enough. I've read a book about critical pedagogy, which really made me think. So clearly the first term is not what we're talking about. So in everyday language, of course, critical means being negative. It means you find fault. So remember, I used this term critical friend earlier on in talking about one's own writing. And a critical friend, of course, will say constructive criticism. And capital C critical is a research paradigm, okay, which is to do with the fact that a lot of research doesn't consider what happens in terms of relationships of power and social relationships. But critical pedagogy is pedagogy which says our teaching and learning should perhaps consider an awareness of power structures and social equity. 
So it tries to tie awareness and learners to the position in a particular historical, social and political context. So I'm going to draw on some work on critical pedagogy to show you different voices which occur in academic writing. So in academic writing, being critical doesn't necessarily mean identifying errors or shortcomings. It means being analytical and looking at things from different perspectives and reflecting on issues in depth. So remember, innovative research, any meaningful research, is looking from different perspectives or perhaps reflecting on issues in depth in different ways. So one of the things I complain about sometimes to my colleagues at Sunway University is it doesn't just mean that the research has been done overseas and we're doing the same research in Malaysia. That's usually not good enough. You may change the context, but are you addressing a gap in understanding beyond just being in a different context? So taking this, we have critical analysis, but at the same time, one of the voices is to be descriptive. So remember earlier on, I talked about the need to differentiate information and a critical viewpoint. So being descriptive, portraying information is really important in academic writing as well. We're back to the call for detail to create a mental picture. At the same time as being descriptive, we have a power in the area of hedging. And by hedging, I don't mean growing long rows of shrubs. I mean the modal verbs such as could, should, possibly is, is a modal uh, adverb as well. So these kind of may, these suggestive verbs are part of being descriptive, but they also convey your opinion. So descriptive writing portrays enough detail to create a mental picture. And this is also important, especially in relation to portraying the context or the setting of research. So you cannot just purely reproduce. Sometimes you write from your own perspective as well while you're still describing. In other words, while analyzing the ideas and findings of others, you can also project your own expertise and take up your own position. And so doing, display critical thinking. And this is what uh, academic editors are looking for. They're looking for the new idea, the new thought. So descriptive writing, important but not just descriptive. But let's turn to descriptive first before we come to more critical. Yeah, it's a written account of a particular experience. Can I just commend, out with the cameras, can I just commend these two websites to you? The Purdue University Online Writing Lab is extremely valuable for both students and teacher educators as a resource. Yeah, it's got all kinds of wonderful, ready to go, lessons that can be applied if you're developing academic writing amongst your students or you're looking yourself for some help. So uh, Purdue University, a very generous online writing lab. Check it out. And University of Sydney. Sorry, I've got to say that right. University of Sydney. Sorry, a New Zealander loves imitating Australians. The University of Sydney identifies the style of descriptive writing as describing or outlining the way things are or the way things happen. Check out those two websites because there's a lot of rich resources on the web and these two I find very useful. So another uh, interesting website, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which is quite famous actually for te teaching English as a second language, describes descriptive writing. And this is something you might 
I like to think about if you're a creative writer too. Descriptive writing has a unique power and appeal as it evokes sights, smells, sounds, textures, and tastes. Using description in your writing brings the world within your text to your reader. And this, of course, applies as much to creative writing as it does to creating the scene, the setting for your academic research. Third, another resource, there's four of them here I'm giving you, but another one is a point made by Chandler Gilbert Community College from the USA. Descriptive and sensory detail and narrative writing. So they're talking about narrative writing, the one that our students know very well, thanks to SPM. So in narrative writing, writing that lacks description is in danger of being vague or overly general. So it's a balancing act. So we do need descriptive writing as well as your own individual voice. So we've looked at the importance of descriptive writing because you create the scene, the setting, the place, the time for reporting research. Third resource. Yeah, I don't think we say it as Butt College. I think it's Butte College. Um, description can also, when it's in an academic paper, make the position more persuasive. So by being more persuasive, I'm saying you get credibility. Remember, as an academic writer, we go back to what I said earlier. We want to be authoritative. We want to be accepted. We want to be credible. So the reader seeing that you have looked at the detail rather than just the general principles is really important. So this is where we do need descriptive work. And you can't just simply have lists of information. Just like when you quote other people's research, you have to establish the links between the pieces of information. And this is where the other voice comes in. Okay, so we all aspire to be aspiring, hence my picture of spires. Sorry about the bad pun. I like this cathedral because it's St. Stephen's Cathedral. Enough of me. So it is clear that being descriptive can be a good thing, and it, it's what's needed. In fiction, it can be absolutely wonderful. But at the same time, we need to look at what is happening with other people's work. Okay? And attribution. So let's have a look at how we can be sharing other researchers' work. So I want to move on to sharing other researchers' work. We've talked about the necessity of description. Now look at sharing other researchers' work. Now, but notice when you share other researchers' work, you can still put your critical position. And we get it here. The writers have already discussed a paper by Pearson. Pearson likewise suggests. Now, you already know that they think that this is a weak position. So these kind of verbs are an important way of being able to put your own judgment in writing. And when we're getting our students to read critically, they should look at these kind of verbs and how they're used. Um, asserts, states, affirms, suggests, yeah. yeah. So they don't quite agree with this. So you are, while you're sharing other people's research, you can also be establishing your own position. Because later on, they go on to say, can in fact be attributed less to. So that started off by suggesting something. This is about a stereotype that Chinese 
Hong Kong students as passive rote learners. It's a whole stereotype that Chinese students are supposed to be passive. They critique that. And then later on, they go and say, can in fact. So actually, they're saying this is the reality we believe in. So these kind of phrases are a way in which an academic writer puts themselves inside a paper. So this is part of the academic voice that enables you to include your opinions and your view by drawing on other researchers. How you lead into the quote or the paraphrase and how you describe the quote in the paraphrase establishes your position in relation to the ideas that you are sharing from other researchers. So we call this attribution, yeah? So when you're attributing to people, you want to quote them, you want to weave them into academic writing, you can be making your position in relation to these particular findings clear by how you use the verbs that lead, that precede the particular quote from other researchers. However, as we're asserting already, description is not enough in an academic paper. It needs to be critical and analytical. And remember, our definition of critical is not necessarily to be negative, but rather to assert a position of thinking that shows that as an academic writer, you have something original to contribute. You're not just paraphrasing everybody. You've analyzed and you've established a position, a way of thinking that makes your paper an original contribution. Because as an academic writer, we want to be an original contributor. And we want to show that we're able to think and be analytical and be critical in the academic sense of the word of critical. And you want your expert voice to be a critical voice because you show the reader that you are a thinker. And also this links to reading. So I find when I'm reading papers, you know, academic papers, that I do make notes as I go along because sometimes I think and I go, oh, I don't know if I quite agree with that, but I'm not sure. So reading with a critical eye is also important and being able to differentiate where it's the author's voice that's coming through, whether it's descriptive, it's purely descriptive and informative, or is it assertive of a position. So when we're reading as well as when we're writing, and we're deciding, you know, who to incorporate in terms of our academic writing as well, and when you're reading a piece of research, you do look at the reputation of the writer. And this is where Google Scholar is very useful. You know, um, Google Scholar, you can see who's reading what, and it helps you with your research because it links to what other people are doing and shows you the reputation and credibility of a particular writer. Importantly, as we read academic writing and as we write, we need a coherence of argument. To a certain extent, this comes back to what I suggested in the earlier session, which is a through line. So obviously in academic writing, you capture the whole through line in the abstract of academic writing. And you know, usually you can't write the abstract until you finish the whole paper. Yeah, really, it happens like that quite often. But you need to have coherence of your argument. And so one of the things that often is missing from some ab academic writing is signposting to your reader where you're going. So this can be obvious statements like, we will now turn to the issue of coherence at the paragraph level. When we're looking at whether someone has written an authoritative piece of research, obviously how you link it to previous research 
who you quote is also very important in making it acceptable, appreciated, and well-read authoritative research. And back to our key point here, how the researcher's own voice is presented is also very important. So let us return to some ideas of voice. Okay. Now, uh, LA stands for language acquisition. I have to do this because I know in Malaysia, everybody has to have acronyms left, right and center. You know, there's so many acronyms and SLA stands for second language acquisition. So I'm going to look at the writer's views in this piece. Now, this is typically dense academic text. You're not going to find this on WhatsApp at all. So if you read the first part, you come down to despite continued debate among SLA researchers, despite. So they are making the point that, that even though the first statement is a clear assertion, it is debatable. So you notice here the writer's views have come in. So it's perfectly fine to make your opinion clear. But again, even if you make your opinion clear, despite continued debate among SLA researchers, you've got to back it up. So they do. For example, Doty 2003. Then in comes the writer's view. An ongoing issue in language awareness is, however, how best to stimulate and channel awareness to inform this debate. So all the previous paragraph is viewed by these writers as a debate, as differing opinions. They haven't said they agree with any of it yet. To inform this debate, much research, which much, oh, sorry, I'm misreading. To inform this debate, more research, which contrasts the learning effect of different approaches, such as Tooth, 2006, Lee, 2007, would be particularly useful. What they're doing here is they are signaling where they're going to go with their research. Yeah. So they have laid out other people's research and they're saying to inform this debate. In other words, we don't agree with all that went before. More research would be particularly useful. They don't say our brilliant research is coming. No, it's not American game show. So in that extract, we have the voices of both the writer and other researchers. And a number of authors are discussed in it. And you've got their view. OK, so they don't put the view that more research is needed to anybody else but their own. So very good academic writing enables you to have both descriptive that I've talked about earlier, but also your own voice in the academic writing. So the recommendation can be heard. The writer's voice can be heard in the recommendation for further research. Yeah. So just go back again. If you read the last sentence. Now, moving on. Sometimes you don't need to pepper everything with, with quotes uh, from everyone all over the place because you are able to put purely descriptive sentences which are assumed, okay? This is from a colleague's work on Chinese students. Institutions faced with often large numbers of Chinese students. Clearly, this is pre-COVID, huh? Institutions faced with often large numbers of Chinese students are wondering what to do about these perceived problems. It's perfectly fine to have an, uh, a, a quote. You don't have to put research backing everything because this is um, a known fact. Yeah, it's understood. However, 
opinion can also come in. The route of accommodation towards what are seen as characteristically Chinese learning styles in the spirit of what Jin calls cultural synergy seems hard to bear. Notice the modal verb I talked about earlier, seems hard to bear. Okay, so they, they are asserting their opinion here. Next is the factual statement. Instead, higher education institutions are offering orientation courses and study skills and English for academic purposes training prior to and during the courses, which otherwise make few concessions to Chinese or other overseas students. They go on and say, and then we get the direct writer's voice. And in this paper, we will focus on expectations for Chinese undergraduate students to display autonomy in the British higher education context. So you can use the personal pronoun when you want to highlight yourself as the writer and assert your presence directly into what you're talking about. Now, clearly, we have to create cohesion and weave different voices. And inside the weaving of these different voices, we have the following characteristics of academic writing. So I'd like to briefly just go through some of these before I talk a little bit about this concept of hedging in academic writing. Um, these characteristics are, are fairly well known, but I'd just like to, to link it to the author's voice in that we do want a certain amount of complexity and we can weave complexity by including detail. So there's the role of descriptive writing. Formality, we don't want can'ts, it has to be cannots. And formality doesn't mean super long sentences. So one of the problems sometimes is we get very long sentences. And formality also means, please, if you're writing academically, the first set of abbreviations, the first acronym, please define it fully first. Because we have this habit in Malaysia where we have abbreviations and acronyms going all over the place. We found this during COVID too. Some of them were acronyms in Malay, some in English to confuse us. By precision, you do need to pay attention that the whole process of backing everything by references is very thorough. And my hint would be, choose your journal first, write in that style, write to the journal style before you submit it. Start by using what they want as the rubric. <clears throat> Objectivity is tempered by being critical. Objectivity means also if I make an argument, I've got support for my argument. So you can be objectively argumentative. huh? The objectivity, the sense of being objective comes if you present, obviously, a counter argument. And but if you want to weigh one in your favor, do so with research to back it. <clears throat> Sorry, explicit. Signal, be explicit also in your signaling where you're going in your academic writing and be accurate. Especially applies to references because that's something that is easily picked up if you're writing for a journal. Hedging, I'm going to talk a bit more about that next. And responsibility is obviously all the things of how important ethical research is and how plagiarism is easily picked up. And this is a problem with some academic writing. But every good journal will submit your paper for plagiarism testing. And it is an issue in some places, something we really got to stop. So back to the critical research, and I'm going to finish off shortly, leaving time for some questions. So look at these phrases. You can see the voice of the writer. Some of the characteristics of it, this is a, a consciousness raising. Some of the characteristics of a consciousness raising approach are apparent. Not are clear, are apparent. 
is a judgment. Yeah. Then you see phrases further down, like according to this. There's some doubt in that. Not as can be clearly seen, but according to this. So the writer's voice is in there. And then we see more judgment. The awareness consciousness distinction can, however, be difficult to maintain. So here we see assertion of the writer's opinion, the writer's voice. Is the critical voice. Notice they are trying to keep it not too general. So they use words like can and usually to be cautious. So this is where we see the writer talking to the reader, highlighting what she wants the reader to notice so this is where the reader comes in here yeah? and they're linking parts of the text and establishing their opinion in their voice so this is a little bit complicated but sometimes we have these things going on as part of the writer's voice we have the anecdotal illustrations we have their own research evidence and we have quoting from published sources we also have the writer's own descriptions and explanation. So an academic writer's voice is weaving a lot together. So in this case, uh, you can see, and I won't go into this in detail, yeah, and WC is not water closet. It's the writer's comment, okay? And we also see judgment things like, are not usually. We see descriptive, the purpose of the GAL project was. We see the writer's comment. Little research has been done in this area. But in order to support that, they do quote, actually, it's a friend of mine's work. They do quote one writer. But they put in the limitations of the study. So you notice here how an academic writer's voice can be heard in a text so but just quickly i often get asked this so i just put this in and i'm coming to the close here we do need to look at tense usage especially if we come from a second language background um, chinese speakers and also malay the sama so we have the role of tenses in academic writing where we sometimes are talking about a specific action with a simple past and sometimes we use the present perfect um, to do background information in a paragraph. So tenses are also very important. So this is something the present perfect is used quite often to introduce background information in a paragraph. And the future, of course, a specific action that's going to happen, like I will conduct semi-structured interviews. Hedging, very briefly, Important in academic writing, both the nouns, assumption, claim, suggestion, the adverbs, perhaps, possibly, likely, apparently, indicators of degree, approximately, roughly, often. These play safe because if you do a very general statement in academic writing, you may get shot down if you're not able to really support it. So these hedging, this is a way of making it safe for us. And there's all these kind of verbs, yeah? So you can again ask Uncle Google to find this kind of information. Why do we do this? Because we are never absolutely sure in our research whether it's the answer, because unless you've got the world's greatest sample in the most widespread area, you can't make too many general claims on the journey of academic writing. And what I've tried to do is to show you that if it's academic writing, you will be telling your story, drawing on others, just like we do when we write in fiction. And your expertise is going to be shared. So think of the through line, as I said earlier, 
And the source of that, as with the earlier presentation, is a wonderful book by Chris Anderson on TED Talks, the official TED Guide to Public Speaking. It applies to writing too. So I hope that when you come to the end of the wharf, like this lovely place in New Zealand where there's my sister, who's just retired from academia, when you come to the end of the wharf, when you come to the lookout at the large view, I hope you've taken your reader on the journey. Remembering the characteristics of academic writing, I have been trying to look at how we can build an academic identity through effective use of voice and how that you can incorporate your own voice in the objective form of academic writing. Thank you very much for listening. And now we'll go back to uh, looking at some questions and answer time, I think. Amarjit, it's over to you. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, so we've come to almost the end of today's uh, session. So we'll open up for, um, we have time for approximately uh, three questions. So let's head straight to the first question, Prof. There is a question from Mina. Um, yep. Often when I want to start writing, I hesitate, thinking that a lot have already been written on the topic. Would people still want to read mine? How do I overcome this? Everybody, Mina, everybody has a unique voice. And let's let's be frank. Perhaps there are not many original thoughts in the world, but you have your own unique voice and your own experiences, which are not going to be the same as any other individuals, unless you have a twin sister, perhaps. And so what's what's important is rather than saying, oh, no, I don't I don't think I've got anything important to say is to think about to focus more on what is your passion? What do you want to say? Forget the fact that there are other people writing. There are, there are millions of other people writing. But focus instead on what is your story that you want to share and then just do it. And then if you, you, you get writing and you, you feel a block, the writer's block again, find a good friend and share the story with them. So remember... Uh, you know, a writer is, a, is an introvert who doesn't want to look people in the eye. So go ahead, find a critical listener and share your story. But it's a bit like Nike says, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Prof. And let's head to the next uh, question from Jessica. Okay. I'm writing a paper on a topic that is relatively new and less researched. How do I ensure my literature review is adequate and appeals to the readers? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. And an important one that often comes up, um, especially with digital literacy developments. I had the same problem with the paper I had to revise yesterday. You know, there's not a lot of research in it. What I then need to do is to perhaps assert that there is not a lot of research in it by finding the key words of the little bit of research that exists and using those key words to see how much there is. Like use Google Scholar, for example, and put in those key words and see how much literature there is. And if there isn't much, you can, you can assert that uh, there is uh, only a little, never say there's none, because inevitably there'll be some somewhere. But th there is, uh, this is a beginning area of research. This is a relatively novel area of research. Then you put, uh, you put the um, quote from the one piece of research or two pieces of research you have found in that area to show that you have looked at it. Yeah? Now, your literature research will be as adequate as it is to suit your purpose. So sometimes you may find parallel things to do with your particular area. 
You noticed I used TED Talks to look at some principles of writing. So that's another way that you can, if you feel there's not enough, you could find a sort of parallel topic and, and add to your literature uh, findings by doing that. Does that help? And I hope that helps uh, Jessica and answers your question. Thank you, Prof. And we'll take one last uh, question that someone has sent to mm -hmm. me privately. Um, she says, how to continue to be creative and ensure uh, creativity in writing will be appealing to the readers for long term? How can we enhance our creativity in terms of long term? Yeah, yeah, uh, well... That's, that's personally, I find that a very interesting question, having been in English language teaching for coming up to 40 years. Um, I, I think the thing is to, for me, the sources of creativity are a very personal thing. Um, I, I give you an example. I just finished a paper on meshing analog and digital. Now, meshing is, I'm a, I'm a percussionist, I love music. And meshing is where you take two songs and you mix them up and they become a third song. So if you like, the sum of the parts is more than the two songs. And I was, I was listening to a, mesh, a meshed up song. And I thought about the fact that in terms of what I've been doing over the last two years with COVID, I've been meshing up analog and digital. Now, my example of how, why did I, how did I get that idea? I didn't get it from the literature. I got it from something else. I got it from listening to a song. So I think being open to other expressions helps creativity. I find listening to my students helps my creativity, especially in this digital age. And and, uh, you know, read other genres that may give you ideas that may not necessarily fit your particular genre. Read poetry, read literature. Uh, it can inform our creativity as much as academic writing, because reading too much academic writing, I do not find stimulates my creativity too much. Yeah. Listen to music, talk to others, pick other people's brains and also go for the aha mo moment. As I said, sometimes I'm walking in the park and I suddenly go, oh, yeah. So I turn on my mobile phone and I voice record that idea. Sometimes you get creativity from many wide sources. And I think it's then being a little bit of a renaissance man and a woman and listening and exploring other genres and not just being stuck in everything educational all the time, because that can be a real danger. You can turn into a really boring educator that way, in my view. That's what works for me. In the end, though, it's doing things you enjoy, doing things you're passionate about, and let that fuel your creativity. Thank you, Prof. Works for me. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you so much for answering oh, the questions from the good, audience. Yeah, there's a good comment here from Audrey. She says to be aware of current trends and needs of readers. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, go on to Goodreads and see what kind of things they are. Join the KL Book Appreciation Facebook page. Find out what other people are reading. And, and, and that helps with the writing enormous amount, I think. Yeah. So thank you so much. Basically, we have come to the end of our session. It has been really, uh, been really inspiring. Uh, bottom line is, uh, we need to be passionate about what we want to write about. And also, um, always remembering uh, to bring in creativity in our writing. And I think you yeah. have uh, given us um, wonderful insights uh, to people who are uh, just beginning to write and also uh, those who have been writing. It's a refresher, you know. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of uh, English Language Teaching Centre, we would like to thank you, Prof, and we are so grateful. 
um, for the time and effort that you have taken to share your thoughts and experience uh, with us. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today and supporting this event. Um, have a great day, stay safe. And with that, we conclude today's uh, session. Thank you very much, everyone, for being part of this. Yeah, education is so, so important and you're doing a great job. So thank you very much for having me here. You're most welcome, Prof. Thank you and see you soon again. Okay. Bye for now. Bye for now, everyone.